Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This study is going to be on, well, I guess the short version would be Cain, the first Freemason. I was uh, doing some studies and looking around at some things, and somebody mentioned, uh, well, on the community page, you got that five-hour video by that guy who's a music musician. I guess he got saved. Uh, he just, I've only watched, oh, maybe 30-something minutes of that five-hour video, but what I saw was pretty decent and there's some other people recommending it i had like three people rec send me that uh video and i think it was him that said uh freemasonry is the old world's oldest religion false religion anyways uh, the mystery religion right I I think he's right. Or whoever wrote that, I think they're right. So let's take a look. Now, why do I say Cain was the first uh, Freemason or Mason? Well, let's take a look at what Masons do. Freemasons were free as opposed to being slaves. That's why they were called free masons. But masons and masonry has reference to stonework. I mean, carpenters build with wood. Masons build with stone. So they were, you know, instead of calling them stone masons, which is sort of redundant if you ask me, uh, they were like bricklayers, but, you know, they would take the stones and cut them into shape and then stack them. And when I was in Germany, I, I looked at some of the old architecture and I found it amazing that they could take an arch, like a doorway arch, and put the stones uh, above the arch and they didn't fall down and collapse, you know. I thought, wow, that is really amazing. But the weight of all the other stones keeps them in place, keeps them from moving. Uh, so they had, they wouldn't, supposedly the legend goes, they wouldn't teach the trade to just anybody you know, you had to be part of the family, whether it was the physical family or the uh, spiritual family. You know, you might be adopted into the Freemason or the Masons. But supposedly they were builders. Uh, many of you probably heard the group called the Builder Burgers. Well, well, you know, they call structures buildings, right? And berg in German means mountain. Perhaps you've heard of an iceberg, an ice mountain. So the Bilderbergers, another one of those front groups like the Council of Foreign Relations and what have you, is uh, they were builders of mountains and mountains when you talk about mountains in the Bible uh, oftentimes it's talking about governments yeah perhaps you've heard the expression building a mountain out of a molehill but really doesn't apply but it's an American expression all right in Genesis 4. Now, why, why do I say Cain was the first Mason? 
And if, matter of fact, uh, masonry, now I've read a lot about masonry. And if I get some facts wrong, please forgive me. It's been since the 90s since I've done a lot of research on the Masonic Lodge. But I had the book Morals and Dogma by uh, Albert Pike, 33, 33rd degree Scottish Rite Mason. You got two branches of the Masonic Lodge. You got the Scottish Rite and then the other one I forget. But when you, uh, when you get to the, you, they got three degrees are the, what they call the Blue Lodge. And they want to suck you in thinking, you know, making you think it's Christian. Okay. And when you have reached the third level, and there's a whole bunch of Masons that have no idea that there's levels above the third degree. None at all. I think it's just, uh, you know, like the, uh, the Shriners that do the Children's Hospital and what have you. You know, they think it's just a do-gooder club and, you know, help each other find jobs and what have you. You know, they... They have a saying, helping good men uh, be better. Well, the Bible teaches the opposite. Uh, the Bible teaches we are born in wickedness and need a redeemer. Whereas a lot of these false religions teach that uh, we just have to do good. Uh, my own sister... I was trying to witness to her, and she thinks I'm a nutcase, so whatever. But she's like, well, you know, uh, God has a scale, a scale of justice, you know? You got the right hand and the left hand side. And God weighs your good against your bad, and if you got more good than bad, you get in. I'm like, uh, no, that's not how it works. But... I don't know. Maybe she learned that her husband was a uh, a mason, and he's dead now. But uh, I was trying to learn what I could from him. I mean, they won't reveal. There's a lot of things they won't reveal. Uh, they might tell you some things, like uh, you know, yeah, we get together and do projects to help people and blah blah blah, whatever. Uh, and he actually had a Masonic Bible. That's how I found out he was a Mason. He had a big, beautiful, hardback, uh, large Bible. And I, I looked at that. And I was like, wow. And I pulled it off the shelf and opened it up. And there's a big compass, you know, their little square and compass. And I said, oh, you're, no, you're a Mason, huh? He goes, oh, yeah, I'm a Mason. And, uh, and that was back when I was doing research, doing all this stuff. So, but um, there's people who left the Masonic Lodge. And then there's people that do, that sell books for the Masonic Lodge. Like that Albert Pike book. It was written to, for, to and for the Masons. And then you got Mackey's. Um, I think he's, uh, his book is on symbols of the lodge. And I bought that, uh, Albert Pike book at a used bookstore. You know, maybe the guy was a Mason and he dies and the wife is like, yeah, I want to clear, get rid of all this old books and stuff. I, you know, she's not a Mason. She's not an Eastern star. So contacts the bookstore and say hey come on over to give me a price on all these books you know they go over oh i'll give you 50 dot bucks for all these books and, yeah sure you know they're just gathering dust taking up space so and then when you go to the bookstore that's ten dollars a book and, and they got a whole bookshelf for 50 bucks or whatever 100 bucks or whatever they give them so but i looked up in that book 
And when you get to the upper levels, you are absolutely worshiping Lucifer. But the first three levels, they make you think it's Christian. And then when you're going, getting ready to go from the third level to the fourth, this is the big break. You go from Christ to the devil. And what they'll do is they're going to test you. And they'll ask you, oh, okay, you want to be the next... Uh, well, they, I don't know if they tell you the next level or not, but what they'll do is... Do you renounce Jesus? And, uh, you know, a lot of people say, oh, no, absolutely not. And then they'll say to you, oh, well, that's good. You're the kind of man we want to keep here. You know, we want to, we want to keep you here. Um, you know, you made the third level. You're at the top. Very good. Pat you on the back. You're just the kind of guy we want. And he'll never know that there's a fourth level all the way to 33. But if you say, oh, pfft, yeah, well, I, I renounce Jesus. I deny Christ. Yeah, I guess they'll put their arms around him and say, yep, you're just the kind of guy we want for the, for the fourth degree. You ever heard uh, giving somebody the third degree? That comes from the Masonic Lodge. You ever heard of getting a square deal? The square and compass? Yeah, that comes from the Masonic Lodge. Uh, yeah, he got a square deal. Yeah. Yeah, you get caught going doing something evil, and you go to court, and you flash your little Masonic hand signs, and the judge knows you're one of them, and then, you know, well, yeah, you're guilty of that, but I'm going to, you know... Time served, small fine, uh, no jail time, no no additional jail time or whatever. Or they'll find a way to throw the case. Especially if your uh, prosecuting attorney is in your same lodge, right? So when you, uh, when you go up the ladder, you'll find out it's the seething power of Lucifer who is the true knowledge and uh, we're going to find out that uh, that's what Lucifer or the serpent in the garden offered Eve so let's take a look at uh, Cain the first mason that's in genesis chapter four cain had just killed abel and he's running you know he's uh he's gonna run off to the east god's gonna kick him out genesis 4 16 remember God pronounced upon him he'd be a, a vagabond. He just killed Abel, and God's kicking him out. Verse 16. And Cain, Genesis 4, 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Enoch, and he builded a city, and he builded a city, stonemasons, right? And called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. According to my information, Enoch means instructing, you know, like a teacher. So did they teach him uh, stonemasons? Now, God, remember, Cain was a, a tiller of the ground. God cursed the ground and said, Cain, you're not going to be able to grow 
you're not going to be able to grow food. We'll we'll get more into that. Maybe I should take a look real quick. Yeah, let's go to verse 9. Verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Hmm. Uh, some people say he killed him with a rock. I'll be honest with you, I don't remember if that's just something that we assume or if it's true. I don't even know, I don't know if it was with a knife or with a rock, but if it is a rock, it would make sense with the, it would be in line with the, the uh, Masonic Lodge stuff, you know. So verse 9, and the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Hey, I don't know. It's not my day to watch him. Now that's the Bob translation. And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the, uh, from the ground. Now remember, the Bible does not teach what the Jehovah's Witnesses call soul sleep. There is, uh, let's see, there's a thing in, I think it's Luke, where Jesus talks about Abraham's bosom, the rich man and Lazarus. It's a story, not a parable. Even if it was a parable, it still rings true. I mean, the rich man died and was in the flames. But uh, Lazarus was with Abraham in his bosom. And the rich guy in the flames is having a conversation with Abraham. And they're, they're all dead. I mean, it's not a parable. And then when you get to the New Testament... Now remember the Bible, I did an entire Bible study on this. Matter of fact, um, did you know Jesus went to hell? For three days and three nights, Jesus went to hell. What do you think he was doing there? He was preaching to the Old Testament saints and said, believe on me, I'm the Messiah. Believe on me and your sins will be forgiven. A lot of people don't want to believe that, but it's true. Remember, Jesus told the um, told the, uh, the Pharisees, asked Jesus, well, what sign do you show us? Well, maybe I should do a thing on it. All right, in Luke 16, uh, verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen. Purple was the color of royalty. There were times in history that if you were wearing purple, you could have been killed because it was reserved for royalty. That's funny. That's, that was one of my, that was probably my favorite color when I was a kid and didn't know any better. So there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. That means he, he, lit, he ate very well. He ate good stuff. He had filet mignon. Verse 20. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. Now, in parables... They don't give people names, okay? Here it is, Lazarus is named. Verse 21, And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels 
Do you know that when you die, you're carried by the angels? And was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now remember, God made a covenant with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, and in hell, he, the rich man, lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. See, there's two compartments in hell. There's the flames, and then there's the, uh, I guess you could say there was the smoking and non-smoking section, I guess, right? And he, the rich man, cried and said, Father Abraham, wait a minute, this guy is a child of Abraham. He knew he was a child of Abraham. He was an Israelite. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, wow, he was a child of Abraham. Abraham even admitted, you're one of my children. Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil, evil things. But now he, Lazarus, is comforted, and thou, the rich man, art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. There is a big valley. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us, that would come from thence. Ah, oh, so we can't go to you and you can't come to us. Then he, the rich man said, I pray thee therefore, father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Yeah, Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house. Verse 28, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they also come into this place of torment. Now the rich man actually cares about his family enough to war try to warn them. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one of them, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said, and Abraham, and he said unto them, unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So there is a hell, and Abraham's having a conversation with this rich man. Does that sound like soul sleep to you? No. There's a lot of people that teach that. It's not true. All right, let's take a look at Matthew 12. You know, Matthew 12 tells you what the unpardonable sin is. And that was attributing the works of Christ via the Holy Spirit, attributing those works to the devil. And you know, there's a whole group of people that gather in the sin of Gog. Say those three words, words real fast. Yeah. There's only one group of people in this whole world that say that Jesus did his miracles by the power of the devil. By doing magic and witchcraft. And uh, they're in the Middle East, and it's not the Arabs. So, yeah. 
So here it is. Jesus does, heals a man. And then he heals a guy possessed of a devil, demonic possession, right? And then they accuse him by the power of the devil of casting out the devil. And Jesus has a lot of things to uh, say about that. And then in verse 34, Jesus tells them, O generation of vipers. Well, what's a viper? It's a serpent. It's a snake. Keep that in mind. O you race of vipers. What? Is Jesus calling them names or is he actually telling them the truth? That will come into play later. O oh, generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. And people, this has got to be the most evil thing one of the most evil times in history. I mean, you know, when I go to other websites or like videos of YouTube and what have you, I love reading comments. And I'm telling you, people are, people are starting to see that the uh, media is not exactly telling the truth <laughs> people are waking up of course they haven't figured out the spiritual aspect but they're they're starting to wake up and i just hope that uh a remnant wakes up verse 36 but i jesus say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So what you say will either condemn you or justify you. In Romans 10, 9, Paul writes, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. And then in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man, speaking by the Spirit of God, calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. So by your words... Be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Matthew 12, 37. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees, you know, the Jews, answered saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. I mean, Jesus just healed a guy and cast out devil and you want to see a sign i mean really 39 but he jesus answered and said unto them an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet jonas 
And no, we're not talking about the Jonas Brothers. Now, Jonas is just the um, Greek rendering of the word Jonah. You know, Jonah and the whale, a whale of a tail. Yeah. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus says he's going to go to the heart of the earth. What do you think he's going to do? He's going to preach to Abraham and all the people in his bosom. I'm the Messiah. And I actually did a uh, Bible study on this. Um, Christ went to hell. 1 Peter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Well, we're the unjust, and Christ was the just. You know, there's a reason why uh, Mary was a virgin. There's a reason for that. Of course, your new Bible versions just say, no, she, she was just a young woman. If you got a Bible that says in Isaiah 14, young woman, throw it away. You don't have a Bible. You have Satan's commentary on the Bible. And, you know, I'm not King James only. I like the King James. I also like the Geneva. And I'm starting to gain a newfound respect for the Septuagint. But uh, I haven't studied out the Septuagint totally yet, so... Uh, they call it the LXX 70. All right, so for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison the spirits in prison and um, some people will try to tell you oh that means he went to the preach to the fallen angels in hell because now he's going to let the fallen angels in hell have salvation don't believe that junk he went to Abraham's bosom to preach unto the children of Abraham telling them for three days and three nights I'm the Messiah believe on me and thou shalt be saved. Pretty much. I mean, that's my guess of some of the things he might have said. And so, soul sleep. Uh, so that was what happened before. But after Christ was resurrected after three days and three nights, he took everybody with him to heaven. Remember he told the, the thief on the cross, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise? Was Jesus lying? I don't think so. In Luke 23, 43, you know, the thief said, uh, Lord, remember me, something along those lines. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now, how do I know they're, in, uh, they're uh, in heaven now and not still in Abraham's bosom? Well, Revelation 6 and verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried. Who cried? the souls under the altar. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little while, for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren 
that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And all those people that believe in the pre-trib rapture, I mean, here it is, the souls of the people are under the altar and they're, they're told, well, you're going to have to wait a little while until the fellow servants and their brethren should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. But the pre-trib rapture crowd is like, eh, we're all going to be in heaven having the marriage supper of the Lord and everybody else is going to be suffering and dying on the earth. And I mean, like, really? No, the marriage supper of the Lamb doesn't happen until the last person is saved and the Lord returns in glory. The resurrection of the saints does not happen until after the last trump. And there are seven trumps in Revelation. And the seventh trump is the last one. And they want you to think there's a seventh last trump before the tribulation. Uh, I can't find it anywhere. No. When the last person that belongs to the Lord is killed and the Lord returns in glory, that's when they're going to be given resurrected bodies. Not before. We're not going to be up in heaven having dinner with the Lord while everybody else down here is getting slaughtered. No, doesn't work like that. Uh, that's why I have absolutely almost no respect for uh, the pre-trib rapture crowd. Uh, like Ken Hoven, he, he, uh, when it comes to evolution and stuff, he was really pretty good. Uh, on a lot of things. And he spent over nine years in prison because he started speaking about the uh, the new and then the world and then the order of Satan. And to shut him up, they threw him in prison for nine-something years. Well, guess what? When he was doing Bible studies in prison... They found out, oh, uh, wait a minute, the pre-trib rapture doesn't make sense. I can't find it anywhere. So he changed his position. And it's funny, all those fake churches that used to invite him to draw a crowd, now he's persona non grata. Oh, well, we don't, you don't believe in the pre-trib rapture anymore. You're not welcome in our Baptist church. Go away, Kent. You know, that's how they are. Trust me, I know. I've been disinvited a few times. Oh, Bob, hey, how'd you like to come to our Bible study? Oh, sure, why not? And then you start asking questions that they know they can't answer that proves them wrong. Well, you're a uh, dividing influence. You got to get out of here. You better leave. Yeah. That's why I gave up looking for a church. Gave up. If the uh, Lord wants me to be in a church, well, well, we are the church. You don't go to church. We are the church. But the Lord of, wants me to be part of a group, well, he'll show me. But I'm not looking anymore. So, so here it is, the dead. These people are dead. They have no bodies. And they're crying with a loud voice, asking, when, when is God going to judge and avenge them? Doesn't sound like soul sleep to me, does it? No, 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 no. All right, so let's go back to Genesis 4. Verse 9, well, verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass... When they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Maybe with a rock. Who knows, right? A stonemason. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Hey, not my day to watch him, right? 
And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the earth. Oh, okay, yeah. His soul is crying out, Lord, Cain killed me. Verse 11. And now art thou cursed, God speaking to Cain, and now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. Let me explain something to you. This is the curse of Cain. I also did a Bible study on the curse of Cain. Never again would Cain be able to grow food. And some Bible scholars that know a lot about the Bible, and me, I don't put myself in that category, by no means. But we believe that not only Cain, but all his descendants. When you do a study of Cain's descendants, and I'm going to do a little bit of something on that, not one of them is a farmer. Zero. Prove me wrong. I got a $100 bill. I'll send anybody can prove to me one of Cain's descendants farmed, grew food. Nope. Never. Not that I can find. And now art thou cursed from the ground, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. Is there a group of people on this earth that never grow food? Huh. Are they merchants and doctors and lawyers and... Uh, sell jewelry and uh yeah i wonder is there a group of people yes there is if you look the lord says a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth have you ever heard of the uh Wandering you-know-whos, a fugitive and a vagabond. The wandering you-know-whos. Verse 13. And Cain said unto the Lord, Oy vey, I mean, I'm sorry, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Well, you deserve to die, but... Uh... And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark... A mark upon Cain. The Lord put a mark on Cain. A mark. See, God's people have a seal. You know, that's why I love the King James Bible. When you go into, like, words and phrases, it explains, you know, it explains it. God is set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Hmm, I wonder if that mark was a, uh, a star with uh, six points. I don't know. I mean, compare that, the mark, with uh, the mark of the beast in Revelation. 
You know, six, six, six. You know, I don't know. All right, so uh, we, do we want the mark of the beast or do we want the seal of God? 2 Timothy 2.19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. And no, we're not talking about an aquatic marine mammal. Or, 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 or. That's what some uh, so-called Bible teachers would probably tell you. Oh, yeah, it's the Eskimos, dude. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think it's that kind of a seal. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. In Revelation 7, 2, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal, the seal of the living God. Huh. The seal of the living God. In Revelation 9, 4, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not, which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And I did a Bible study on the seal as opposed to the mark. Okay, so. So, back to Genesis 4. Verse 15, And the Lord said unto him, Cain, Therefore whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. I'm going to, I got to look something up here real quick. Oh, Nod. Nod means to wander. Ah, okay. So Genesis 4, 16, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Now listen to this. And Cain knew his wife. Where did Cain get a wife? Very good question. Some people will say that, well, you know, Adam and Eve had not only brothers but also had daughters so Cain married a sister some people teach that Bible doesn't record um, that Adam and Eve had any daughters you know or Eve had daughters doesn't record the Bible doesn't say yes doesn't say no so that's open for interpretation so we're going to take a look at something real quick and Cain knew his wife, and she conceived. See, this is how you know that when, when the Bible says no, you know, uh, you know, somebody knows somebody, they conceive. Well, she conceives. Obviously, uh, knowing them in a carnal sense. And she conceived and bare Enoch, and he builded a city. What? Wait a minute here. Hold on. It's just hold on a cotton pick a minute here. Cain's got a wife. She has one kid and he builds a city. You don't build a city for one kid, a husband, wife, and a kid. Where do you get the labor from? Oh, well, that don't make no sense. Actually, Keep that in mind. It will. And call the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. What does the word Enoch mean? The name 
I'm telling you, people, when you in the Old Testament, all the names have meanings. Matter of fact, somebody did a Bible study of the names and meanings of those names from Adam throughout the Bible all the way to Christ. Um, I mean, I did a Bible study on it, but it was other people that did the work. Very, very interesting. I mean, it, the names of the people in the Bible show the plan of salvation. That's why, you know... People try to say, oh, well, you know, some just a bunch of people, uh, you know, made the Bible just to control us with religion. The Romans invented Jesus to control us. I don't think so. They might think so. And they'll find out one day when they're rich with the rich man who uh, is still in hell probably in the flames, wishing that Abraham had sent Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in a little bit of water to cool his tongue. He's still down there, I'm pretty sure. So, Enoch, instructing or instruction. Now, if you want to know where you know you just don't you don't build a city for three people uh uh-uh new no. but if you want to know where he got the manpower to build a city and where he got his wife possibly may i suggest my study on ezekiel 31 i'm just going to briefly go over it give you some food for thought. Ezekiel 31, verse 3. Behold, the Assyrian. The Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of an high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. Uh, the waters made him great and deep set him up on high, with her rivers running round about his plants and sent out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. I am of the opinion they are talking about family trees here. So, verse 6. All the fowls of heaven made their nest in his boughs, and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young, and under his shadow dwelt all great nations. That word nations there is the same word they get Gentiles from. It's the same word. Thus was he fair in his greatness in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. Listen carefully. The cedars in the garden of God. Now remember, the Bible uh, the Assyrian was called a cedar in Lebanon. Remember that. We just read that in uh, verse 3. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon. A cedar is a type of tree. Let's go to verse 8. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. What was the garden of God? Eden. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him what you see people they're talking about family trees trees in eden in the garden of god and they envied him uh do trees have emotions no this is a figure of speech we're talking family trees we still use that expression in the 
English language today. Oh, I want to do some research on my family tree. The trees in Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Where did Cain get his wife? It's very possible. This is my theory. They were here, evidently, during the same time as Adam and Eve. And this is not some new, this is nothing new. This is what they taught over a hundred years ago in churches in the United States before they were bought and paid for by the enemy. These people were in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Where did Cain get a wife? Probably here. Unless, you, of course, you want to believe that Eve had daughters that are not listed and Cain married one of them. Now, it's possible, but this is, it seems to be more probable. You know, nobody teaches this stuff. Almost nobody. Nobody teaches this stuff. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Hmm. Now I have an entire Bible study on this verse. And I'm going to try to remember that when I post this, that I put links to those other studies. Now, if Cain got a, a wife that existed before Adam and Eve, or maybe not before, but at the same time, where did he get the manpower to build a city? I suspect this. There were other people in the garden with Adam and Eve, evidently. So, where did Cain get a wife? Probably this. Where did he get a labor force to build a city? And isn't that what Masons do? They build cities? Absolutely. Cain could very well have been the first Mason. The mystery religion. Now we're going to go more into this, but uh, what did Satan tell? Uh, what did the serpent tell Eve? Oh, you know, good and evil. Your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall know good and evil. Oh, yeah. You'll know good and evil. Your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall know good and evil. And that's in Genesis 3 and verse 5. The serpent said unto Eve, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Yes, I'm going to teach you secret knowledge that God doesn't want you to know. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Oh yeah, secret knowledge. There we go. The mystery, the mystery that's concealed. I'm going to give you secret knowledge. The mystery, the mystery religion. Now in Genesis 10, verse 8, we're looking at, looking at Canaan's, uh, we're looking at Canaan's line here. I mean, I could do a whole, oof, I could do a whole study on that. 
Genesis 10. Um, let's take a look at Genesis 10. This is uh, ties into this stuff pretty close. Now, this is after the flood, the flood of Noah. I know some of you won't believe me, but that's okay. It's not a, you know, but some people, they argue over, you know, well, some people argue the flat earth, the round earth. Does it make a difference? No. Other people will say, oh, well, the flood was local. No, the flood was worldwide. But I want to throw this out at you. If the flood was local, why didn't the Lord just tell Noah to move? Okay, it's going to flood here. So why don't you go, you know, crawl up that mountain and I'll flood the valley here. Why build an ark? You know, is it a point to uh, disfellowship over? Oh, well, only if you're a Baptist. You know, I know I pick on the Baptists. I went to one of their Bible colleges. So I'm allowed. Genesis 10, verse 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah. Shem. Shem was the uh, chosen seed line from which Christ, when you, when you trace Christ's line, lineage, his generations back, it goes through Shem. That's where you get the word Semitic. Shemites, Semitic. Uh, so you got Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham is the uh, the not so blessed seed, the cursed seed. And none of them were sons born after the flood. The sons of Japheth. Now Japheth was not cursed. Matter of fact. Uh, even though Japheth was not the promised seed, they could come in after a while. Now, that's a whole study in and of itself. But listen to this. The sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog. You ever heard of Gog of the land of Magog? Or is it Magog of the land of Gog? I forget. But Magog and Gog are supposed to um, invade the land of Israel in the end times. Keep that in mind. Oh, and by the way, everybody points Magog, the land of Gog or whatever, Gog and Magog, whether it be a person or a land area, they always place it in the land of Russia. Well, guess where the... Uh, Eastern European, you know who's are from? The Jews. Were, <laughs> they're from that area. Poland, Russia, Eastern Germany, uh, Ukraine. So the sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog and Medai and Javan. Uh, Javan is tied in with um, Greece and Tubal. Let's see, what does two ball mean? Uh, two ball. No, I forget. But, uh, and Meshach and Tyrus and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz. Do you know what the uh, Eastern European Jews call themselves? Ashkenazi Jews. And here it is. The sons of Japheth are Ashkenaz. This is where they get the word. And Ripoth and Togarmah. And the sons of Javan, Elisha and Tarshish. Uh, do you know what Tarshish is? Uh, an ancient name for Spain. Kittim and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles. Same word as nations. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their, in their lands 
everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. You know, I'm not going to say this is a mistake or a mistranslation, but the same word used for Gentiles in verse 5 here is the same word for nations. So the King James people translated the same word in one place in the same sentence. Or, well, yeah, basically the same sentence. One place, Gentile, and the other nations. All right, so here we're going to get and take a look. Verse 6. And the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, and Phut, and Canaan. Now, Cush, uh, today, I don't remember... I think that's tied with, uh, it's either Ethiopia or Egypt. I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up. But it's in a, that area. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I think Cush is Ethiopia and Mizraim is tied in with Egypt. And then why, why does the son of Ham have a son named Canaan? Cain and Cain and Canaan. I don't think I'd want to name a kid after Cain, Cain do you? And the sons of Cush, she, Seba, Havilah, and Sabta, and Ramah, and Sabtika, and the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush begat Nimrod. Now remember, Cush, uh, you know, Anybody related from Ham is, just remember, Ham's not kosher. And I don't read anything in the Bible good coming from Ham. Absolutely nothing. And I'm not talking about food. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Some commentaries say he was a hunter of souls. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter, before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Babel. Now remember the Tower of Babel, right? Tower of Babel. And if you look, um, let's see, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Cana. There's that Cain again with an E-H on the end, on the end. In the land of Shinar. Do you know what the land of Shinar is? That's where Babylon was. Babel and Babylon are the same area. Uh, you know, Mystery Babylon. Oh yeah. That's you know where Nebuchadnezzar was from, Book of Daniel. Out of that land went forth Asher and built it Nineveh. Nineveh was where Jonah went to to repent, uh, preach repentance. That was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Now remember, the Babylonians took Judah into captivity. And before that, Nineveh and the Assyrians took Israel captivity before that, like a hundred and something years. So here it is. These people are all tied in with Ham. Out of that land went forth Asher and built at Nineveh and the city of Rehoboth and Kela. And resting between Nineveh and Kela, the same is a great city. Now, wait a minute here. You know, think about it. Ezekiel 31. Here it is. They just come off the uh, uh they just come off the, the the ark and they're talking about the same as a great city. So I I don't know. Alright, so and Mizraim begat Ludum and Ananim and Lahabim and Naphtali to him and Pathrusim and 
Tasluhim, out of whom came Philistum. Now, Philistum, what are they talking about? The Philistines. And Kaphtorim. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn. Now, Canaan was cursed. And Sidon was tied in with the Phoenicians. Think about that. And the Phoenicians were tied in to uh, Hannibal. Hannibal was, uh, oh, I got to think about it here. Carthage. Carthage. Carthage was absolutely and totally, almost totally destroyed by Rome. They were tied in to the Phoenicians. They were traitors. They would get on their ships and go all over the Mediterranean. So, the Sidonians. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. Well, uh, let's see. Isaac and Rebekah, well, Rebekah was complaining that her son Esau, you know, the one that God hated, Nobadiah won, that he had married the daughters of Heth, the Canaanites. She was extremely unhappy. She says, oh, if my, if my other son marries one of the daughters of Heth, what good is my life? Now, I'm paraphrasing there, but it's pretty close to the truth. Verse 16, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gergesite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite. How would you like to belong to a tribe called the Sinites? And the Arvadite, and the Zemurite, and the... Hamathite, and afterward, after the families, afterward were the families of the Canaanites, the Canaanites spread abroad. Wow. You know, when God told Israel to go into the land, what did he say to do to the Canaanites? Oh, love them like your neighbor and preach unto them the laws of Moses so that they'll love me. Uh, that's the Moody Bible Institute uh, teachings. But uh, my Bible says, go into all the land and kill everything that breathes. Yeah. So kill them all. Kill them all and let God sort them out. That's, I'm paraphrasing there. All right, so. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 17. The Lord says, But thou shalt utterly destroy them. Destroy them. Namely, the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Oh, yeah. Destroy them. But... But God loves everybody. Uh, I don't think so. Read Obadiah 1. God hated Esau. Why? Because he married the Canaanites. All right, so let's take a look at uh, the Masons building the first world, New World Order Masonic uh, building project. Genesis 11. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Probably Hebrew. Probably. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Now remember, Shinar is Babylon and Babel. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick. Let us make brick. Stone masons, Freemasons, here you go. Let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. Hmm. 
And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Have you ever noticed all the pyramids, people? All the pyramids, whether they be in China, whether they be in Egypt. Oh yeah, there's pyramids in China. The largest pyramid in the world is in China. But the communists won't let us look at it. It was discovered during World War II when uh, some supply planes were flying, flew over it. And they took pictures. And I think somebody looked at it uh, before the communists took over after the war. But we aren't allowed to look at it because the communists don't want us to look at it. From what I understand, it's in the desert. But, uh, you know, you got pyramids in Egypt. You got pyramids in South America, Latin America. You got them in Mexico. Why? And I think they always have a flat top on the very, on the very top. They're always flat. Why? Well, here too. Genesis 11, verse 4. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Yes, you're building your stairway to heaven. Oh, yeah. Who do you think's behind all this? The fallen angels. You think these are the fallen angels that probably, you know, look at the stonework on these pyramids. Masons, right? Stone masons. Some of those stones are huge. How do they how do they build these things? You know, fallen angel tech? Did the fallen angels help build these things? I don't know. I don't have a time machine. I can't go back and watch. Although I wouldn't mind watching. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Oh, yeah. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord said, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Little side note here. Do you know why the Masons all over the world, why they all have their little signs and symbols and their little secret handshakes and their hand signs? Because no matter what country you are in and no matter what language you speak, you will recognize each other and you will understand from the sign and symbols that they do. Think about it. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth and they left off to build the city. What do, stone, what do masons do? They build things. City. There are... I can't find hardly any good references to cities in the Bible. Hardly any. Verse 9. Therefore is the name of it called Babel or Babel because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Confusion. Confounded. 
There you go. They wanted to build their stairway to heaven. Oh, yeah. So. All right. Well, I guess this is enough for part one. And let me tell you something, people. Google to Google images and type in pyramids. There's pyramids in Mexico. There's pyramids all over Central and South America, all over the place. I mean, because of uh, Google um, Earth and the satellite imaging, they're finding uh, abandoned, destroyed, abandoned cities where the jungle has overtaken and overgrown the place. I mean, they're finding stuff they can't hardly believe. I mean, it's amazing. They have found uh, stones, stone structures up at above 10,000 feet. You can hardly walk and, and make steps, you know, run. You can't even hardly run at some of these elevations because the air is so thin. And yet they've got these huge stones that were moved and placed on top of each other, these structures. I mean, if you can hardly breathe up there, where do, you know, how do they build these things? The only guess I can come up with is uh, the fallen angels. That's it. I mean, you know, take a look at uh, in uh, Cambodia. There's a uh, temple there on the Thai, Thailand, Cambodia border. Uh, the Khmer civilization built it. Absolutely amazing. And it was abandoned. So, you know, there's uh, stuff going on. We just don't know. And uh, there's a guy named Brian... Forster, F-O-E-R-S-T-E-R. -E -E uh, if you type in his name on YouTube, uh, and this guy finds all kinds of, he spends a lot of time and energy exploring these type of places. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing, some of the stuff that he's uh, taking a look at. Archaeology is you know, they hide this stuff from us because they don't. They want us to think that uh, we were a bunch of knuckle draggers, and now we're starting to, you know, advance. But uh, when you look at some of the structures they had back in the old days, they were pretty. They were pretty advanced. I suspect it was the fallen angels, but I don't know. What do I know? I'm just some guy that turned the TV off and read the Bible a couple of times. So once or twice. So, all right, well, take care. And I guess this is going to be the end of part one. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.